A reading from the book of Genesis. At that time, Abram was very rich in cattle, in silver, and in gold. Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents, so that the land could not support both of them dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they could not dwell together, and there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. At that time, the Canaanites and the Perizzites dwelt in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, and between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Soar. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east, the, e, journeyed east, thus they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, while Lot dwelt among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked great sinners against the Lord. The Lord said to Abram, after Lot had separated from him, Lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I will give to you and to your descendants forever. I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, your descendants also can be counted. Arise, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. So Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamre, which are Hebron, and there he built an altar to the Lord. The Word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Jesus said to his disciples, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before swine, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Whatever you wish that men would do to you, do so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate that is narrow, and the way for the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. The Gospel of the Lord. There's a lot of very interesting uh, commentaries on today's uh, Gospel's passage, specifically with regards to um, that treasuring what is holy and the pearls, uh, but also then obviously uh, the narrow gate, the narrow way. There's so much commentary on those texts. So I thought we would focus specifically on the church fathers and then a couple of contemporary uh, commentators. And so with regards to what is holy, do not give the dogs what is holy, do not throw your pearls before swine. So if you look in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, there is specific instruction to throw to dogs certain meat that has been mangled by wild beasts. So it says if you find meat that has been, or, or animals that have been mangled by a wild beast, take the meat and throw it before the dogs. So basically it's not worthy of your consumption. There is a similar thing with regards to any meat that has been offered to idols. So don't participate in any food that has been offered to idols because that is to participate in the idolatry. What is sacred, specifically that word used here in the gospel today, is often and almost always associated with what is offered in the temple, at the altar, and specific with regards to sacrifice. So that is what is holy, what is sacred. And so it is these sacred gifts that are given to us, which is not to disregard them, is basically what the Lord is saying today. And so to take what is holy, to take what is sacred, to take what is a treasure, and to treat it as such and not to become, again, indifferent towards it, where we would just kind of throw it to what is not worthy of those things. And so then when we go back to the church fathers and we look at their commentaries, when they're saying, okay, well, what is this sacred gift, this holy treasure, this pearl of great price? They have three kind of streams of commentary on it. All are correct and all of them obviously relate because of the multiple layers of Scripture as Scripture reveals to us kind of different depths of truth. And so the first treasure that is given to us, as some of the church fathers say, is our own nature, our own nature, made in the image and likeness of God. It is a treasure and a gift. I am not my own. I am created for another. And sometimes that can get confused in us. We think that it is my life, that it is me and I, and these things are all mine. We are a gift created for God. We are a gift created by God. And so this gift that we bear, our interior, the way in which we are made like God, this is something that we have to return to Him in a perfect state. And so our growth and our imperfection, our growth in holiness, this life is an opportunity to move towards that perfection where the image of God is restored in our soul to that state of perfection. That is growth in holiness. It is a treasure that we have been given that we must guard and protect because we know that it is something that must be returned to the creator of this treasure. So first, it is ourselves, this great treasure. It is our interior, it is the way in which we are made like God. It is the gift of our soul that has been given to us by the Heavenly Father. But also we know that the pearl of great price also represents the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And this is something which also dwells within us because of His grace and is something that we must guard and protect. 
when we are in grace, that is something that then we must protect as if it was a great treasure because it is. It's worth more than anything that we could be given in this life or in this world. It is the gift of the life of heaven, the gift of the life of the Trinity. Grace disposes us so that we can become temples of the Holy Spirit. It is a great treasure because it is by this gift of God that we inherit then eternal life. If we die with this treasure within us, this gift of grace, if we die in a state of grace, then we enter into eternal life. And so it must be protected at all costs. The last kind of stream of commentary says that the pearl of great price is Christ himself. I thought that was also very profound. It is this treasure in whom all other gifts are contained that comes to us from the heavenly Father. One of the contemporary commentaries, commentators, he notes as well that this pearl of great price that is Christ he was given to us in a certain sense, handed to the wild beasts, those who had fallen into sin. And in our sinfulness, we tore him apart, tore him apart. This gift of the Heavenly Father in the Passion, we trampled upon him because of our sin. It's a profound image. But through this taking upon himself of our sin, he conquers sin. And he comes back to us in the resurrection as this pearl of great price. And he comes to us as a gift in himself, having taken away our sins, having opened to us eternal life. This pearl that was cast before swine is now stands before us glorious, radiant, resurrected. And he then comes to us as a gift in the Eucharist. This resurrected Christ wants that within us the image of God is being restored, that his grace is within us, and then in the moments of Holy Communion, we receive him, this pearl, this treasure from heaven. Our Catholic life is a life that protects a treasure. At the center of our life is a treasure, which is Christ. He is this pearl of great price that we center our lives around. Christ is the central mystery of our life. God who dwells in our midst. And so that is this great treasure that we aim to guard, to protect, and to make sure that our disposition is one of always, a reverence that is due to this treasure. Enter by the narrow gate. The majority of the commentators and the church fathers point out the narrow gate is simply Jesus himself. It is narrow because there is not many options. There is no other option. We only go to the Father through the Son. That's it. The gate is narrow that leads to life because it is singular and it is Christ himself. He is this pearl and this treasure, but he is also the way that we must enter through. And in order to enter through the doorway that is Christ, we must become like him. And so it is our conformity to Christ that is the entrance by means of the narrow way. We have to pass through Christ, with Christ, in Christ, into eternal life. And so it is Christ who always stands at the center. He is this treasure given to us. He is the narrow gate. He is the one we must choose, the one we must love, the one we must treasure. Amen.